Hi, I'm Damon Smith, Extension Field Crops Pathologist for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Today I want to just talk about some smart disease management decisions, especially in years where we have low margins for grain production. First I just want to say that don't forget your integrated pest management decision making processes. The things that we've learned years ago are still applicable today. However, I want to cover five specific disease management decisions which I think will be really helpful in a year like we're about to come into. First, I think it's important for you to consult your records and field history notes uh, to prepare for the upcoming season. We can make a lot of uh, disease management decisions just based on the field history. We can use that history to make variety or hybrid selections. We can also make decisions about rotating in particular fields. And it can also provide us uh, some information on what we might expect in terms of disease issues. The second point I want to make is that choosing the right variety or hybrid for your particular location with a high level of resistance is a really cheap way to uh, reduce the amount of disease that you might see in a field. Spend some time studying the variety hybrid test results uh, for, from the state of Wisconsin and then choose varieties or hybrids that are rated well for the particular diseases that you know you have in your fields. The third point is to rotate crops. Many diseases that we deal with are residue borne. So if we can simply rotate out of a field for one or even two years, that's a cheap method for managing uh, specifically those residue borne diseases. The fourth point Plan on time. Delaying planting in Wisconsin will often set us up for the crop to be at a susceptible growth stage at a period where diseases really start to become an issue. Typically in Wisconsin, our disease issues don't get here until late July or early August. Thus, if we plan on time, the crop is not at a susceptible stage at that time when those diseases arrive. The fifth point I want to make is to plan some time for scouting or hire a certified uh, crop advisor to assist you in scouting. In-season scouting will help in, in some decision making, especially on the fungicide uh, application decision uh, that you'll need to make in, in season. So let's talk a little more about each of these points in detail. First, consulting records. As I mentioned, this can help you in variety and hybrid selection can help you make a decision about rotation and it gives you an idea of the risk in a particular field as it relates to, to diseases. Let's use an example here. Uh, we'll talk a little about white mold of soybean. You'll remember that white mold uh, results uh, from infection by spores that erupt from these little apothecia here, these little mushroom-like structures. The formation of apothecia is critical for white mold and soybean. We have to have the formation of those little mushroom structures during the time that soybeans bloom. And the majority of infections in soybean occur due to apothecia from inside the field. In other words, where the diseases happen in years past is typically where we see the higher pressure areas of a particular field. Thus, this particular disease is considered an aggregated type disease or a disease that occurs in, in localized areas within a particular field. Let's look at this in a little more detail. This is some apothecial scouting data uh, from 2015 and some research plots. We actually had two separate plots here uh, de depicted by this grid being the first plot. Here's the second grid depicting the second plot. And then we have the days after seeding here along the bottom, along with the growth stage of the soybean crop in these particular locations. The intensity of red in each of these quadrats uh, tells us how many apothecia there were. So the brighter the red, the more apothecia. The, the more pink color, the fewer apothecia, and white indicates no apothecia. And you can see as we proceed through the season and we get to the R2 growth stage, in other words, full bloom in soybeans, we see that there's a large flush of apothecia in these plots. But you also note that the primary aggregation of that inoculum, especially in this particular grid here, is over to the left side of the field. You can see that aggregation continues with a little bit of uh, uh, more apothecia appearing here a little later on. And then by the time we get to the R3 growth stage, you'll see that the number of apothecia quickly fall off. And by the time we get to R4, we don't have any apothecia in the field again. 
Now let's look at this a little different way. We can look at the number of spores as it relates to the number of apothecia in the field. These blue bars here indicate the average apothecia uh, per plot, and then the red line indicates the spores that erupt from those apothecia. And as you can see here, as the number of apothecia increase, the number of spores we trap increase, and then as the apothecia go away, the number of spores that we trap uh, goes down to zero. Okay, so we have to have those apothecia in the field, uh, and those apothecia basically give rise to most of the infections that occur inside that field. So now we can actually look at the disease severity index levels in that particular field, and what you'll notice right off the bat is that as we do our ratings through time here, again days after seeding underneath the, each of these grids, you'll notice that the disease severity index scores are primarily higher in those areas where we saw the higher levels of apothecia. So the moral of the story here is that if you know where you have high levels of disease in a particular field in a given year, those are typically going to be the problematic areas of those, those fields in the future, especially for white mold. So knowing where those are and which fields those are help you make some decisions about varieties and rotations and those sorts of things. The second point I made uh, early on was to choose an appropriate variety or hybrid. I would encourage you to consult uh, the extension documents A3653 and also A3654. These are the corn hybrid performance trials and also the soybean variety performance trials. Uh, these are conducted each year by our corn and soybean agronomists here in the state of Wisconsin. And these are an ex excellent resource to consult to choose the proper varieties and hybrids for your location. It also provides you some information about particular disease resistance traits, which can be very helpful, especially if you know something about the disease levels in your particular field. So let's take a, 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 an example here. We'll look at Phytophthora root rot on soybean. Phytophthora root rot is caused by the uh, oomycete organism, uh, Phytophthora soji. Mortality is usually prevalent in fields that are wet or have heavier soils that hold water. And if you plant early in the season and it's cool, uh, uh, you'll, you'll oftentimes see some issues early on with emergence or even uh, uh, some damping off. Now the primary methods of managing Phytophthora root rot would be to use some seed treatments or also resistant varieties. And I would encourage you to really look at the resistance ratings on uh, whatever variety you're going to choose for your particular fields, especially if you know you've had Phytophthora root rot issues in the past. Let's look at uh, some genes that are effective for controlling Phytophthora here, uh, especially in the state of Wisconsin. There are various genes that are deployed against the specific races uh, that you have in a, in a particular field. Now some sampling years ago in Wisconsin has shown that the RPS1K gene here is effective against the majority of the races that are found here in Wisconsin. In fact, uh, that data suggests that about 99% of the fields uh, this RPS1K gene should be effective. RPS1C is another common gene that's deployed in many of the varieties grown here in Wisconsin. That particular gene would be effective in about 75% of the fields. So if you've known you have uh, Phytophthora issues in the past and you've struggled with that, I would encourage you to look at the uh, soybean uh, resistance gene that was deployed for Phytophthora in that particular variety, and then maybe choose one if it wasn't RPS1K, maybe try to choose a variety that has the RPS1K trait. Where can you find information about those genes? Well, in Table 11 in the Soybean uh, Variety Book uh, out of the state of Wisconsin, over here in this column, you can see that the RPS genes are actually listed here for Phytophthora root rot. You'll see the RPS1C and then the RPS1K genes listed depending on the varieties. Again, if you've struggled in, in past years, try to look for varieties uh, that have that RPS1K. Now the third point that I made was to rotate crops. Many diseases are residue borne, so managing that residue can reduce the level of initial inoculum in a particular field. Tillage can be helpful uh, from this standpoint. However, in areas where we want to practice conservation tillage or we're running a no-till system, that obviously isn't an option. So rotation would be the next uh, 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 way that we would manage that residue, and rotation really is a cheap option. Let's look at an example here, anthracnose stalk rot uh, on uh, corn. So anthracnose of corn uh, is caused by Calitoxicum uh, graminicola. 
There are several phases of this particular uh, disease. We can have a leaf blight phase, which you see here in this image here on the left. We can also have a top dieback and stalk rot phase, which you see here in this image in the, in the right. So one thing I'll say is that, you know, usually early in the season, we often see the leaf blight phase year in and year out. This doesn't really impact or have anything to do with how much uh, stock rot we will see. So I, I will say don't get too excited about seeing this type of damage. This usually happens year in and year out. However, we want to do uh, some, some uh, scouting later in the season, again, for your, your field history notes and your records to chart whether you've had stock rot in the past. In 2016, that year was a year where we did have high levels of anthracnose stock rot at the end of the season, and that did impact some of the corn hybrids here in the state. So scouting at, that, uh, at harvest time or near harvest time can help uh, with the, that record keeping. Now we know that uh, anthracnose, uh, the anthracnose stock rot pathogen is a residue borne pathogen, meaning it overwinters on corn residue in those fields. It, is, uh, it makes spores on that residue, and those spores are then rain splashed onto the corn plants in season. Now, this particular fungus is a poor competitor outside of corn residue. So simply managing that residue can reduce the amount of spores that are available uh, in season to infect those plants. Therefore, tillage or rotating can help manage this. Again, if tillage isn't an option for you, rotation can be. And I would say this is a very cheap option and something that you should consider, especially on fields where you've struggled with stock rot, you have known stock rot issues, and you know you've been corn on corn for several years in a row. Some other treatments that might help would be uh, chemical control. Seed treatments have been shown to reduce some of the damage from anthracnose stock rot uh, or the anthracnose fungus. And then also, again, consult the resistance ratings for the particular hybrid you're interested in. Now the fourth point I made was to plant on time. And let's look at an example here with northern corn leaf blight. Now northern corn leaf blight usually is a major concern in years where it's uh, above average in terms of rainfall and below average for temperatures. Those are usually the conditions that lead to high epidemics of northern corn leaf blight for us here in Wisconsin. Now in 2015 and 2016, we had some major epidemics, but one thing that helped us here in the state was that those epidemics started late or later in the season. They really didn't get a foothold until July or into August. Those uh, farmers who planted on time at the end of April, early part of May, uh, were able to push the crop to a growth stage that wasn't highly susceptible once the epidemic started. And they were able to actually escape uh, a substantial amount of yield reduction in grain because the, the crop was not susceptible at the time of arrival. Now, had we planted the crop later, let's say uh, mid-May or something like that, then the crop would have been at a more susceptible growth stage and this uh, major epidemic would have been more impactful. Uh, uh, in that, during that time or in that scenario. Now the fifth point I want to make is to take some time scouting. Scouting can help, uh, help you not only in your record keeping, but it also helps you in making some decisions. If you don't have the time to scout in your operation, I would encourage you to hire a CCA to assist with that, uh, that uh, scouting. From a fungicide application decision standpoint, this is really critical because we know that fungicide application decisions are based on uh, or need to be based on disease risk, uh, how much pressure is there uh, as it relates to the particular growth stage that you're looking at. So let's talk about this a little more uh, in depth. Each year we run uh, fungicide trials here in the state of Wisconsin. We uh, usually conduct these at the Arlington Agricultural Research Station. You'll see a number of uh, particular foliar fungicides here applied at, at uh, different growth stages on corn. VT here indicates that that application was made at tasseling. V6 would have been at the vegetative uh, growth stage early, earlier on in the season. And then you'll see some V12 or two pass applications of fungicides such as this preemptor application here. We rate these plots for various diseases each year uh, and, and other traits including say lodging and greening. We also look at ear rot and then of course yield. We've sorted this table from highest yield to lowest yield. 
And one thing you'll note here in the 2016 trial is that really when we look at the statistics, we didn't have any statistically significant differences for any of the ratings here. However, you'll note that we have a, a wide range of yields from high uh, to low here. So what's going on with these, with these treatments and is it really economically viable uh, to use fungicide on, on uh, hybrid corn here in Wisconsin and when is the best time to use fungicides? So first before I drill down into some of these questions, I just want to give you some break-even scenarios for corn. So if we uh, look at uh, primarily uh, strobulern plus DMI uh, premix products. So these are things like Quilt Excel or Headline Amp, which you might be familiar with. These products are very commonly applied to corn now uh, here in the upper Midwest and especially here in Wisconsin. So the pricing of these products as of today would range uh, at the rates that we're using them would range from about $20 an acre to up upwards of $35 an acre, including the, a $7 application charge. Uh, so there is a wide range of about $15 here, and you can see the pricing across the top. Along this column here, we have the corn price in dollars per bushel. So if we consider, say, a corn price today of maybe about $3 to $4 uh, per bushel, and we're looking at a range of $20 to $35 for our fungicide application cost, the uh, amount of corn we need uh, over not treating in our treated plots would range somewhere between 5 uh, to almost 12 bushels. Okay, So keep this in mind as we talk a little more in detail about responses that we see out of some of these fungicides here in Wisconsin. Now we've looked at a four-year data set now, uh, primarily from trials at Arlington, Wisconsin. Uh, especially, in, we're especially interested in these premixed fungicide products. So again, the DMI uh, plus strobulurins. And we have a number of uh, replicated treatment observations now at various timings for these particular uh, 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 products. Uh, actually upwards of 51 replicated treatment observations here uh, from 2013 to 2016. Now what we can do with this type of data is we can do some things like look at frequency distributions of the mean yield advantage uh, over not treating. And then we can actually look at the return on investment calculations to see what are the odds of actually getting our money back where we use these products. So let's take a look at the frequency distribution here for these 51 treatments that we have over the last four years. These bars indicate the yield difference uh, for each of the observations, replicated observations that we made over the non-treated control. So bars uh, that are, are going down below the zero line indicate there was actually a loss uh, compared to the non-treated control where we applied fungicide. Bars that are going up indicate a positive gain in yield over the non-treated the non plots. You can see on average here, uh, not accounting for anything in these trials other than just looking at the premix fungicides, we can see that we average about a one bushel per acre gain. Okay, so it is a positive gain, but we only have about a 47% frequency of positives in this data set. So you know there's, there's something else here that's going on and we need to look at this in a little more detail. So what we did is, is based on some uh, previous data, uh, we split out uh, the treatments where we had high levels of disease and low levels of disease. So these are the same 51 observations you saw in the previous slide, but now we've broke them out into a situation here where we have low disease. In other words, on ear leaves where we've rated for specifically northern corn leaf blight in this case, we take the cases where the severity ratings on those ear leaves are 5% or less. And those cases are here in this upper, upper box with the yellow bars. In the lower box with the red bars, we have the cases where foliar disease was what we consider high or above that 5% threshold. Now, if we look here and, and, and do some simple statistics, we see that about 31% of the time in the low disease situation, we have uh, uh, some success. However, overall, the mean yield is actually negative at about negative four and a half bushels. Now, if we take the high disease situation here in the lower box, we actually see that 74% of the time we have uh, positives with a mean yield of about five and a half bushels. So we can see that disease levels really do impact our success here in terms of getting our, our money back uh, out of these fungicide applications. 
Now we can look at this a little further. We can actually uh, take the statistics from those fre frequency distributions and we can actually calculate the probabilities of recovering our fungicide application costs. So I'll ask you to remember that we were looking at a range uh, in our strobe you learned uh, plus DMI fungicides of somewhere between $20 and $35 here. So you'll see along this lower axis here, we have that fungicide application cost. We've got the probability along the uh, Y axis here. And then each colored line indicates different pricing scenarios for corn. So you remember we're using the three to four dollar example, so we want to look at the green and purple lines here. And I've, uh, I've boxed in here 20 to 25 dollar range for an average fungicide application cost. In our low disease uh, situation then, the probabilities of actually recovering our fungicide application costs are about 10 to 15 percent. They're not zero, but they're not great, okay? Now let's look at the high uh, foliar disease situation. Now the situation changes quite a bit. So you'll see again along the, the uh, horizontal axis here, we have the fungicide application costs. Along the vertical axis, we again have the probability, and then each colored line is a different pricing scenario for, our, for a corn. And now in the high uh, disease situation, you can see the probability or chance of getting our money back goes up. Our range now is, is somewhere between 35 and 52% if we assume that it costs us uh, somewhere between $20 and $25 an acre for our fungicide applications. So the disease levels really do matter here when it comes to fungicide applications on hybrid corn. So just to summarize, I think it's going to be really important if you're, if you're interested in using uh, fungicide and hybrid corn, you need to do some scouting and consider how much disease pressure there is there in that field. What's the right growth stage to do this? I would say immediately prior to tasseling. That'd be the best time. We know from some other work that the tasseling uh, application of the tasseling growth stage is a growth stage where we get the most response out of these fungicide applications. So targeting that timing for the application and doing some scouting prior to that uh, time can be really helpful for you to make that decision. Other things to consider, fields where you have corn on corn, uh, you planted late, you're irrigating, or you know you have a, a susceptible hybrid, those fields would be at higher risk and would elevate those, those chances of recovering your uh, cost from a fungicide application. Now during your scouting, for example with northern corn leaf blight, if you see 50% or more of plants with 10% severity on ear leaves, or I'm sorry, on leaves uh, um, uh, below where the ear would form, you're going to have a, a higher risk uh, for disease uh, later in the season and you'll probably see some impact out of that fungicide or at least positive impact out of that fungicide application. Now let's take soybeans and look at uh, some similar uh, uh, um, return on investment calculations like we have done with corn. The primary disease of concern in, in soybeans in Wisconsin would be white mold. Each year we run a white mold uh, fungicide efficacy trial. This is one trial at uh, the Hancock uh, Research Station. You'll see in the uh, column here we have disease incidence and then uh, disease severity index score. And then we have yield and we've sorted these from the highest yield uh, to lowest yield. And then the non-treated control uh, falls right here in the, in the table. I've also included the yield advantage over not treating here in this column uh, over here to the right. One thing you'll notice, and this is uh, pretty consistent from each year uh, in our trials, is that we generally have a couple of treatments which usually flow to the top. This approach at nine uh, fluid ounces, uh, R1 uh, uh, followed by an R3 application, uh, this usually is one of our better treatments, followed by the Endura at eight ounces uh, with a single application at R1, and we considered this our positive control in this particular trial. You can see here that we, uh, in the approach to pass application, we had uh, almost uh, or over seven and a half bushels uh, gain over the non-treated in that particular treatment. And with the uh, single application of Endura, we had almost four and a half bushels gain over the non-treated. Other uh, treatments in here uh, also gave us some positive gains, but were uh, actually on the bubble in terms of being economically viable here. So let's look at uh, another uh, trial here. We know that Approach and Endura are usually really efficacious products, however the timing of the of application really is important. 
This trial here was also conducted at Hancock in a different field. You'll see we had really intense pressure in this particular field, high disease incident scores, high disease severity index scores. Again, we have yield here in this column and we've sorted the table from highest yield to lowest yield. You'll see again we have Approach and Endura and then now Proline in here because these are usually products that perform fairly well for us in our efficacy trial, but you'll see the timings are uh, uh, vary uh, with these products. And what you'll notice inside the yellow boxes is typically products that were applied at the R1 to R3 growth stage are usually the ones that give us the best responses. And you'll notice that if we go really early at the V5 growth stage or really late after about the R4 growth stage, we can have the best product out there, but if we miss that growth stage window of opportunity, uh, you'll see that we don't get much of a response out of these particular products. So the moral of the story here is to target uh, your applications for white mold if you know you have a field with, with an issue. Target that window of opportunity between the R1 and R3 growth stages. And if you plan on applying fungicide after R4, I would recommend you not do that as you're not going to get a, a positive return on investment. Now let's just look at a little bit of, of pricing uh, here in terms of the, the better treatment. So if we consider the Approach 2 Pass program and the Endura, uh, single pass program, the range uh, here uh, would be somewhere between $35 and $40 for those particular programs. If we think we can get nine to say $10 a bushel for our soybeans, then we need somewhere between three and a half and four and a half bushels to, to break even uh, on that particular uh, program. And you'll remember from the previous slide, if we get the timing right, we're using those approach or Endura programs, we easily made that three and a half or four and a half uh, bushels and then some in those particular treatments. Now let's look at a case where white mold isn't a problem. So each year we also run some uh, trials where we just look at foliar fungicide applications on uh, soybeans uh, just for foliar disease control. The primary foliar disease that we run into here in Wisconsin is Septoria brown spot. You'll see that we've taken some severity ratings on this trial that was conducted at the Arlington Ag Research Station in 2016. And we've sorted this table from highest yield to lowest yield. And I've given you the uh, yield advantage over the non treated control over here in the right hand column. You'll see that we did get some advantage over not treating, but really the uh, averages were, were somewhere uh, around two, uh, two bushels per acre over the non-treated. And this is pretty consistent year in and year out. But that's going to be uh, uh, under what we would need to recover our investment. We really need something more like four bushels, which we see here out of this Stratego uh, yield at the four fluid ounce um, uh, at R3 application timing here. However, this treatment is not necessarily consistent year in and year out. We do see certain treatments respond uh, differently depending on the year. So what I'm saying here is, you know, usually in Wisconsin in most years, you're not going to need a foliar fungicide treatment on soybeans for foliar disease control. You're primarily going to need that fungicide targeted at white mold and fields with white mold risk. So just to summarize here, if white mold isn't a concern, application of fungicide has not resulted in a significant increase in yield for the four straight year in Wisconsin uh, uh, field testing trials. But if white mold is a significant problem, the Endura approach or Proline Stratego yield program seem to be uh, the best um, programs for us here in Wisconsin. However, I would encourage you to make sure you get the growth stages right on these soybeans and get that window of application correct. Again, we want that R1 to R3 window to be the optimum uh, timing. After about R4, you're not going to see much success out of those programs. With that, uh, if you're looking for any more information uh, about fungicides or disease uh, management or just disease ID in general, I would encourage you to consult my website. Uh, the link is here. And then, of course, my contact information uh, with phone and email here. Thank you.